We might need to be praying for the children's workers. They got 18 kids over there this morning. So, uh, yeah, let's praise God for that. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, I'd like to say welcome to Cornerstone Church. Thank you for being here. If you would, please fill out the Connect card located in the seat in front of you, and you can return it to the kiosk in the back uh, after service, and we have a small gift for you to say thank you for being our guest today. We are continuing our series today on the miracles of Jesus. Um, we have looked at a different miracle each week, and we have also been covering some of the core values of our church and when I say core values of our church, these are the things that define our church. These are the things that make up our church. And so uh, we've covered a different one each week. So far, we have co covered deep discipleship, radical outreach, authentic community, and meaningful worship. And today, I want to cover our fifth one. We're in John chapter 6 today, if you would like to turn there in your Bibles, and if you don't have your Bibles with you, we, we'll have it on the screen for you. Uh, most of you are probably pretty familiar with this passage. This is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. And we say he fed 5,000, but he fed more than 5,000, because that was just 5,000 men. So you're talking about maybe three times, maybe four times that, so probably around fifteen to 20,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And so in this passage, um, before this passage, we see that Jesus is performing miracles and they're following him. He's attracting this huge crowd. He has a lot of people listening to him. Uh, he is officially becoming a movement and officially becoming someone that, that people wanted to hear. And so these people are following him and they're obviously hungry, probably like many of you are, and, unless... Randy always is. The people that are following Jesus are hungry. They are physically hungry. They need food. Um, they, they're, it's kind of hard to listen when you're hungry. You know, that's why I like doing breakfasts before service because uh, then you're not hungry and we can go to 1231 o'clock. Uh, maybe, maybe next time. Uh, uh, and, and you're not rushing to uh, beat the Baptist to the, to the restaurants. But these people are hungry. They need food. And I was thinking about how that's symbolic of how today people are hungry. And I don't mean a physical hunger. There's a spiritual hunger there. People are hungry for something more than what they're experiencing. And the way that I've, I've thought about it in the past is they have this hole in their heart this hole in their life, this hole in their soul, and they're trying to fill that hole with all these other things. And typically what we try to fill that hole with are the things of this world. We try to satisfy that hunger with the things of this world. And we're all created with that hunger because we were never meant to um, live without God. We were never meant to live without a relationship with God. And so when we're living without a relationship with God, we know we are missing with something, missing something. And, and I think about it like this, is that our soul is unsettled. You're never going to be able to rest until you live as you were created to live, which is in a relationship with God. We have those groans as you do when you are hungry. Um, you have these feelings. And when I hear my, my stomach roll, I know I need to eat. You know, when I hear that growling, I know I need to eat. When I hear growling from the, the congregation, I know I need to end. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of people, they don't realize they're hungry. They just notice the groans within their life they notice that they're missing something, but yet they try to feel it. They try to satisfy their hunger with the things of this world. And the things of this world will only temporarily satisfy that hunger. They eventually come to people like me and you for help. I was talking this morning with somebody that when people feel that, when pe I think when people feel that groaning, when people feel that, 
uh, hunger deep inside of them, they tend to come to people like me and you. They tend to come to the church because they see, if we're living the life that we've been called to live, they see that we live a good life and they think sometimes on the outside it looks like we have it all together, but me and you know we don't. Uh, me and you know that we need God's help. Um, but there's people who will ask, how do you go through the storms in life so smoothly? How, how, how do you go through the storms of life without letting it really affect you more than it does? And so when, when people go through tough situations, most of the time, they reach out to the church. A, a good bit of the time, they reach out to the church. They reach out to people like me and you for help because they see that we have something. They see that we are different. They see in the middle of the storm that we don't panic. They see that our hunger has been satisfied. As I want to talk to you today from really two standpoints. Um, number one is what do we do when people come to us that are hungry? But number two, what do you do when you're hungry? When you know, when you're missing something, what do you do to try to meet those needs? And so Jesus, he knows these people are hungry, and he knows that, they need, that he needs and the disciples need to try to figure out how to meet their needs. But now Jesus already knows what he's going to do. But he tests Philip here in verses 5 through 7. So let's pick up John chapter 6. We'll start with verse 5. It says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. So Jesus basically asked Philip, he said, how are we going to provide these people with what they need? And John makes it very clear to us that Jesus was testing Philip. So that means there's a right and there's a wrong answer, and Philip answers with the wrong answer, but I think we tend to answer the wrong way as well, because the question for us today is similar. Where do we get the people the help they need? When people come to us, where do we go to get them the help they need? Some examples I thought about of how this might have worked out in your life um, in the workplace, I know I haven't worked at Food Line since October, um, but I know in the workplace, when someone was going through something, they would try to find a Christian to talk about it with. My, my boss, I was blessed to have a manager that was a Christian, and people would just open up to her all the time about what's going on in their life, but they see she's different. And they see that she has something, and they want that something. And so maybe when people are going through tough situations, uh, they come to you in your workplace to ask you for help, and they ask you your advice on things. On social media, I see people all the time reaching out to their Christian friends for prayer. When they are going through something, they will either... Uh, message you they will talk to you they will somehow put it on your radar because they know that you have a connection with God and they want you to pray for them at outreach events people turn to the church for help when things get tough financially um, at outreach events we've done in the church you don't know how many conversations we have to the side with people where they just start spilling everything they're going through in their life and they're just so open with us about what is going on and they want to see if we can help they come to the church for help they come to people like me and you for help and in the world historically people have looked to the church for moral guidance and we're so mixed up now that the world continues to go down the wrong path when the church does not know what is right and wrong the world's definitely not going to know and at this point some some the global church is so confused on what is the truth and that just confuses the world even more but it historically when you look back um our, I, I was watching the george washington special that came out last week and it was talking about how uh george washington kept referring to god uh through through all the storms he faced and how uh, a lot of the founding fathers were christians 
and uh, went to the word for guidance on making this nation and forming this nation. And so historically, the people have looked to the church for moral guidance, and we're not doing such a great job today of, of giving them that guidance. People look to people like me and you for help. And so when people come to it for us for help, how do we respond? Do we respond in the right way? I personally think that um, these are my four circles. Do not make fun of them. I know they're not perfect. Caleb was up here saying one of them looked like an egg, one of them looked like a potato. Um, but these are my four circles. We'll work with it today. I want this circle right here to represent the church. So me and you, someone put a big C there. And so when people come to us for help, so we're just going to put this one as, I'm just going to do a P for people. When people come to us for help, and I'll add up there in a second, they typically come to us, they ask us a question, or they, they seek some type of guidance in, our, in, in their life from us. We're real bad about going to the world to give them advice. We are really bad about giving other people advice that's no different from what a non-Christian would give them. I think we are really bad about thinking from a worldly perspective on not only when people come to us for help, but in our life as well. Philip was obviously thinking from a worldly perspective when Jesus said, where can we go to buy bread for these people? And he immediately starts to think, well, we're going to have to work this many months, and we're still not going to have enough money to buy enough bread to feed all these people. That's thinking from a worldly perspective. When Jesus, God in the flesh, is right there with him, and he can provide all the bread, all the food that is needed to feed these people, he's thinking from a worldly perspective, and we do the same thing. When people come to us for help, we go to, I had a, a few things that I think we go to. Number one, I think we go to the culture around us. When, like for example, let's say someone comes to us and say, my anxiety is so bad. What we tell them to do is turn on the TV, relax on the couch, and take something to calm you down. That's exactly what we tell them. Because our culture is just in love with entertainment our culture is in love with numbing away that hunger because that anxiety is coming from a hunger deep down you're missing something deep down which is why the anxiety is there and so we tell them go home relax turn on the tv take something to calm you down when we should say go to god we should say scripture says cast all my cares on all your cares on me because i care for you that's what scripture says, but yet we give them this advice from the culture. Maybe someone comes to us and they say, I'm having problems in my marriage. I have heard Christians say, just go find someone else. There's more fish in the sea. Just get a divorce. That's not what we should be as Christians telling people to do, but that's what culture says, okay. Another place that we go to for guidance is the government. When someone says, I think I'm attracted to the same gender, we said, well, since the government recognizes it as marriage, then go for it. It must be okay. When co someone comes to us and say, I don't think I want this baby, we say, since the government says abortion is okay, just go get an abortion. And I've never heard those exact examples, but I do know churches that encourage abortion, really. Another place we go is worldly wisdom. And there I'm thinking about science. We put science above the Word of God. We put um, what the world says is wise above what the Word says is wise. And an example I'm thinking about there is someone comes to us and they talk about how depressed they've been recently. And we immediately say, well, just go to the doctor, get on some pills. Just go. Now, sometimes you have to have that. I'm not saying that's wrong. But that should not be the only advice we give people should be more than that and finally this is the most tem the most tempting for me when someone comes to me with a problem i tend to just go straight to myself 
what, 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 is, what do I think is best, and then I give them my opinion. So someone comes to us, and we just say, all right, well, this is what I think is best. Someone comes to us about problems with their coworkers, we say, well, I think you should do this. I, I, I was thinking about this with me. Uh, sometimes when people come to me about problems they have at work, I said, well, just let them have it. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek. But well, that's Nathan's advice. See, the problem with going to the things of the world is that the things of the world will never be able to provide people with what they need. The things of the world will never be able to provide you with what you need. And so if you're going to the world for advice, if you're going to the world for help, your hunger is going to be satisfied temporarily. Because if you're fighting anxiety, just turning on the TV and taking something is going to relieve the anxiety for that night, and it's going to be right back there the next morning. When you are going to, um, when someone comes to you about problems in my marriage and you're not getting deeper into why those problems are there and then working through those problems, you're going to have that problem in the next marriage. That's why there's some Christians that have had seven, eight marriages. See, the problem is, is that the world will never be able to satisfy their hunger because their hunger is so big that nothing in this world will ever be able to satisfy it. Their problems are so big that nothing in this world will be able to truly help. And another thing I thought about is there's so many people that need help that only God can help us help them. There were so many people that needed food in the John 6 situation that conventional worldly methods would not be able to provide them with the food that they needed. It would have took them months, and if people are going months without eating, they're not going to be alive at the end. Our response to the world's hunger must be different, yet if we are being honest, we tend to think just like non-Christians do. The advice that we give our friends is often the same advice that a non-Christian friend would give them. We are practical atheists when it comes to how we live our life and the advice we give other people. We are called not to think from a worldly perspective, but from a kingdom perspective. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. And, I want, and, and once again, I want to iterate that I want you to apply this not only when people come to you for help, but apply this to your own personal life as well. We have to change our thinking or we'll never be able to reach the people in this world because there are so many of them that need help. We have to change our thinking or we will not be giving people the help that they truly need. We have to change our thinking to truly experience all that God wants for us. Philip and the disciples had to change the way that they thought. So let's work through the rest of this story and learn to think as God desires for us to think. And so Jesus asked Philip, where could they go? But he was testing Philip because Philip should have known, not only in this situation, but in a total situation, this is my first point for you today, God is the only one that can provide what we truly need. That should have got more than two amens. God is the only one that can provide what we truly need. When we go to worldly things to meet people's needs, we are giving them chips or carbs when they need bread, when they need something more. And the reason why I use bread, I know it's carbs too, but uh, get, ready to, get ready to connect it here. When you go to the world to give them help, whatever help you give them will eventually run out. This whole miracle is setting the stage for later on in John chapter 6. Jesus says this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, he is not talking about physical hunger. He's talking about that spiritual hunger. He says, I am the bread of life, and if you come to me, you'll never be hungry again. If you come to me, you'll never be thirsty again. And I don't know about you, but I want that hunger deep down inside of me satisfied. 
I don't want to keep going to these temporary things in the world when, when God can feel that need deep down in me. And so when people come to us for help, we must go to the bread of life to truly provide them with what they need. When we go to the bread of life and point them to the bread of life, he will keep feeding them so that they will never go hungry again. So when someone comes to you for help, you need to go to God. He's going to be this circle. When someone comes to you for help, you need to go to God. You need to point them towards the God. You need to make sure that God is part of the solution. Because if he's not part of the solution, there is no solution. But you know, can we do that if we aren't even living that out ourselves? Many of us tend to um, go to the world or go to someone else when we need help. When we can go to the Word. And this Word has more power than my words or Randy's words or anyone else's words will ever have. And we're going to tie that in later about how God wants to use us, but we have to constantly go to the Word. So how do you do that? You go to God when someone asks you for help. You go to the Word. You go to God when someone comes to you. Uh, maybe they're asking you for uh, help. You ask God what you need to say to them before you help them. Like, God will communicate with you. If someone comes to you and they're telling you they're spilling their life story, you can, you can ask God to speak to you to tell you what you need to say to them. And I believe that God will do that. God's done it for me. And if he doesn't leave me to say something, then maybe I need to keep my mouth shut and tell them, let me, let me pray about it a little bit longer. Let me see, let me see what, what God is going to tell me later on. Someone ask you for advice? Go to the word of God. You need to go to God's word. You need to go to God in prayer. And most importantly, you need to point people towards them but you have to make sure that connection with God is strong you have to be spending time in God's word um, I've already lined up I've already, God laid a sermon on my heart this past week for after this series and uh, we're going to be looking at how Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and when we are disconnected from the vine how are you going to give them the help they need you have to constantly be connected to the vine. You have to constantly be connected to God to truly provide them the help they need. You have to constantly go to God. You've got to go to God yourself. You have to make that a pattern in your life so that when someone comes to you, you're already in that pattern and you can provide them with the help that they need that comes from God. And so when people come to you for help and they are trying to satisfy their hunger, point them towards God. Make sure you seek God's guidance. Make point them towards him because he is the bread of life god is the only one that can provide what we truly need but the bible says we are the body of christ you know in this situation you're going to most of you know that this this boy comes up with five loaves of bread and two fish but in this situation God could have automatically provided, Jesus could have automatically provided the people with what they need, couldn't he? It could have been like the manna in the desert where it just pops up, the food just pops up, and then they just they receive it. God can do the same thing today. God could just, just go straight to people and appear to them, and he does that sometimes. Um, reports are that Muslims are having dreams of Jesus. Jesus is appearing to them in dreams, and they wake up and they commit their life to Christ that day. God is appearing to them directly, but scripturally the, um, the pattern that we see is that God chooses to go through the church. Why is that? I don't know. I'm not sure. But I can tell you this, point number two, God wants to use us to meet people's needs. You are the body of Christ. 
He, that's what he says the church is. That's what Paul says the church is, is that we are the body of Christ. And so if we're the body, then we do the work. But it all comes from God. That's why it's scary when people come to us for help and we go to the world because we're not being a very good body when we're drawing from something else rather than the one that powers the body, the soul of the body. Jesus could have provided the bread for these people just like God can, can, can provide everything people need today and he doesn't even have to include us in there and he does that sometimes but the pattern that is uh, most of the time found in scripture and in everyday life is that God wants to use us. And so in John chapter 6, Jesus wants to teach the disciples a lesson and I believe it's the lesson that God wants to teach us today. Let's go on to verses 8 through 9. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? So right there, I see just a little bit of faith, you know? It's like, uh, I don't know, but this might help. Here you go, but I'm not sure how you're going to use it. He specifically says, what good is that with this huge crowd? He basically says... Here is what we have, but I don't know how you're going to use this. And this is getting closer to the correct response. He had a little faith, or he wouldn't have brought it up in the first place. But I believe this is a picture of how God wants us to bring what little we have to him for him to use. God has called the church as the body of Christ to bring our five loaves and two fish to God for him to to use. And so here's my next point for you. Bring what you have to God for him to use. And the way we're illustrating that is an arrow, air, air, arrow pointing up towards God. Bring what you have, your five loaves and two fish, to God for him to use. And so you might be thinking, I don't have nothing to bring to God. Number one, that's a lie straight from the devil. I think we all have at least these three things. Number one, that everybody has some type of strength that they're just born with. You are good at something. There are some things that you're just naturally good at. I naturally have a loud voice, so that certainly helps with getting attention in a room. Caleb naturally has a good singing voice. You are born with certain strengths that have developed in you over time. I thought about how some people are natural leaders. Most people are learned leaders. There are some natural leaders that just seems to be built into their system. There just seems to be built into them, and they can take a, a group of people and lead them to wherever they need to go, whatever they need to do. And I also thought about how some of the strengths we have is from past training or experiences that are strengths that God can use. There's on Caleb, there's a story that you probably heard if you listen to Caleb any, um, but it's called Surgery on Sunday. And they, from my understanding, they offer free surgery on Sundays, and the doctors and the nurses volunteer their time to provide this much-needed uh, outpatient surgery to these people that can't afford it. They literally do surgery and then go to church right after the surgery. That's, a tr that's training or experience that they have received from the past that they are using to glorify God. Because you don't hear people doing that. That's, that is awesome. That gives God glory. You probably have some type of training. Maybe it's on the job training. Maybe you've been trained to be a manager. That's leadership principles that God can use in the church to reach people. Maybe you've been trained on uh, counseling. God can use that. We all have strengths. We all have things that, that, that God has just built into us from the very beginning, things that we're good at, and we need to bring them to God for him to use. I think about singing. Some of these pop singers, country music singers, some of them, can you imagine if they used their voice for God's glory? How many people they could reach? Kanye West, we, you know, he's been in the news a lot recently about converting and there's been nothing to doubt that so far. There's, there seems to be fruit in his life. And um, 
he has taken a gift of rap and singing and composing. I guess he's, he's good. I'm not big into rap, so I guess he's good at composing things. He's taken that gift that was being used for the world's glory, and now he's using it for God's glory. You might have something that you're just naturally good at. Some of you are naturally good cooks. Amen? You can use it for God's glory by feeding your pastor. <laughs> there we go. You have strengths. Use them. Number two, the Bible says in 1 Peter 4.10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. You have spiritual gifts that God has given you. If you're a born-again Christian today, God has given you some type of spiritual gift that can be used for the building up of the church. When I think about a spiritual gift, it's, it's a gift that is developed after you have become a Christian. You start to be able to do things that you were not as good at before. Some examples from the Bible of spiritual gifts. Administration, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, mercy, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, discernment, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, helps, evangelism, and hospitality. For me, uh, teaching really developed after I became a, a Christian. Um, really developed in me through the, which I was eight years old, so I, I couldn't teach much anyway. Um, but I, I truly believe this is a gift that God has blessed me with that does not come from natural strength or natural ability. Um, I think this is, is, is God's gift to me. Uh, some spiritual gifts tests I've taken in the past um, in, indicate that administration is strong with me, leadership strong with me. I've always been a, somewhat of a natural leader, um, but I think God has taken that gift and has uh, fanned it into flame even more. My mother-in-law is great with hospitality. Um, the Hershey bar cake helps a lot with that. I knew you would like that, Randy. The other other week, uh, I was in the room and we were having a conversation with someone. Those few of us in the room, and uh, Angela Whitman down here, she has the gift of encouragement, and uh, I. I kept my mouth shut because that's what God was leading me to do, and it was just really cool to see that gift be used for his glory. That I, It makes me tear up because she's just really good at encouraging people. Randy right here, if I have a question on the Bible, I go to Randy. He has a spiritual gift of knowledge. He reads it. He knows it. We was talking about that on Friday night. They was talking about uh, me and Randy seems to be in opposite table gatherings every week. And uh, they were talking about how they're just, Lisa says she's just teaching it, and Randy is coming up with scripture that applies to it. That's a gift right there. That's a gift I don't have. I have to read and read and read and reread and everything, and Randy just picks it up. That's a spiritual gift of knowledge that Randy has. I guarantee you that you have some type of spiritual gift if you're a born again Christian that God has given you that He wants you to use to reach people. He wants to use the gifts he has given you. And one of the things that I try to be very intentional at is spending time watching and observing what spiritual gifts people have. Because if someone needs help with something, maybe I'm not gifted as gifted as someone else is in that. That's what the church is about. We're coming together. And they can, we, God can use their gift better than, than he can use what I'm not good at to reach them. So everyone has strengths, everyone has spiritual gifts. Third thing here, and this is something no doubt every single one of us have. Third thing that we need to bring to God for him to use is weaknesses. You might be thinking, why would God want to use my weakness? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, he says, to, to keep me from becoming pr proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad 
to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, that is so key right there, is knowing Jesus, God spoke straight to Paul, and he said that my power works best in weakness. We do not view weaknesses, hardship, insults, persecutions, and troubles. We do not view them as a gift. We do not view them as something that we need to bring to God. This is going back to what we were talking about a couple weeks ago. We tend to try to hide this stuff from the church, and we try to hide it from God. We don't want to bring it up. When Paul says, I'm going to boast about it even more, because God's power works best in my weakness. And so what we need to do is start to bring our weaknesses to God for him to use. Great example of this. Many of you have struggled with some type, normally everybody has a big sin that they have struggled with in the past. And we don't want anyone to know. We don't tell no one about it. But God can use that to someone else that's going through the same thing. That's a weakness, that's a trouble, that's a hardship that you faced. And if you bring it to God, God will use it. God will use it. Church, we need to start to bring our weaknesses, our troubles, our hardships to God for Him to use. And so, bring what you have to God. We're never going to be able to reach these people or any, even get close to satisfying the hunger that people are trying to fill with drugs in this community until we bring what we have to God for him to use. Something that uh, someone said to me this past week, and I fully agree, I think many of us struggle with confidence. To you, you may think that what you have to offer is nothing. But so was the five loaves and two fish to feed 15,000, 20,000 people. Don't have confidence in your own abilities, but have confidence in God's ability to work through you. That's a shift that I had to learn, that I, I can't be confident in can do, but I can be confident in God's ability to work through me. I'm confident in God's ability to work through you. He's just waiting for you to bring it to him. So here's what happens. When you bring what you have to God for him to use, God will use your gifts for his glory. That's my next point for you. Verses 10 through 11 say this. Jesus says, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks to God, and he distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Can you imagine what this would look like? Like, I just wonder if they kept going back to get bread, and it just stayed full. Like, how, how did all this happen? I don't know. Endless buffet. <laughs> Randy's dream. Like, I just would, I, I would have loved to have been there and seen this. Going back for the fish, and the fish just keep popping up. They just keep, they're just there every time someone looks at it. And that's because God took what little was offered, and he multiplied it. And he will do the same with whatever gifts you give him. See, what happens is you give your gifts to God, and God says, I'm going to give them right back to you, and I'm going to lead you in the situation that I want you to use it in. But when it comes back to us, it's different than it was going up. It's amplified, is the way I think about it. It's a whole lot more powerful because God is in it, and so then we use it to reach the people. We use it to... To help them and we use it to try to help them satisfy their hunger because God amplifies it 
You can do more with God than you can without God. Everyone needs to understand that. If you try to do just this, boom, it's not going to help that much. If you go up here and then go here, it's not going to help that much. But when you go to God, God's going to give back to you because, remember, he wants to work through you. He's going to amplify those gifts. He's going to strengthen those gifts. He's going to multiply those gifts. He's going to make it more powerful than it was going up. He'll make them more effective than you ever could. And he will use them to reach more people than you alone could ever reach. So what stops this from happening? When I was going back through my message again, God put this in my head. We don't make ourselves available. That's why this ain't happening at the rate it should be happening. It's because we're not available. And even when we are available, we still are not aware of what he is leading us to do. Like, we're not connected to listen to that still small voice when someone comes to us for help. But we have to do what he tells us to do when he tells us to do it. And if he isn't telling you anything, you aren't listening. If he's not telling you anything, you're not spending the time that you should be with God. You're not connected to the vine goes back to the question that we said earlier, where are you going yourself to satisfy your hunger? Because if you're going to the world and if you're not spending time with God, your hunger is not going to be satisfied and it's going to be really hard to give the help that they need. God put this in my head. The reason why we struggle with burnout is because we aren't being refreshed by God. You're giving stuff to other people that you simply don't have. You have a limited supply. But you can stay full if you stay connected to God. You can stay full if you, you strengthen that connection to the vine. You can stay full and aware and connected so that when people come to you for help, you already are, have a, a thriving relationship, a thriving fellowship with God. You can help them. Make yourself available to him for him to use. When I think about examples from my life of when God used my gifts for his glory, I have a different story here. I got two stories because God put this other one in my heart this morning. We have somewhere around probably the record number we've had here at our church since we started today. Um, 75, 76 here, roughly. 50-something in here. Uh, and then 18 kids over there. Is that counting the two adults over there? My, my counter's back there, not the, not the best. Um, <laughs> we won't. That is not their gift, I can tell you that much. Because uh, <laughs> I, I got two numbers this morning that was totally different. Um, this is the largest church I've ever led, largest group of people I've ever led. And I'm just amazed. Because that's not in my power. That's through God. I think about this building. When we started the church, if you're meeting in a gym, setting up every week, wearing out your volunteers, it's rough. It's tough. And from a worldly perspective, what we should have been doing that whole time is saving money, asking the church for more money to start a building fund to build a building we should have been looking for land that's worldly wisdom God very clearly told me you focus on being the church and I'll take care of the rest that, that's not worldly wisdom were we saving money? yes because we started with no money you need some money that's worldly wisdom though to go the route of fundraising. And, uh, there's, and I'm not saying it's anything wrong with churches who do that. But for me and my church and me as a leader, God told me not to do that. And God did something that only he could do. He gave us this building for free and increased our bank account four times what we had in there beforehand. 
back there we have our, our story wall up. And we go all the way back to roughly July 1995. Those dates are not exact. When New Zion Church started over here on Clyde King Road. And then about 10 years later, that, that congregation moved into this building, Hunts Plank Road Chapel. And then 11 years after that, Cornerstone Church begins at Happy Hollow, just right up the road here. And in May, we moved down to the school. And then two years after that, two churches became one. And God knew that when he started the 1995 New Zion Church. You know, that's cool. That's something only God can do. And so that was one of the things I wanted up. Because I want, when people walk into this building, I want them to see what God has done. And we wrote over here to the side, our story is still being written. Because I believe the best is yet to come. When you give your gifts to God, and God will send them back, he'll amplify it, and then you use it to reach other people, God is glorified in that. Here's what happens. When you just try to reach them, you get the glory. But when you go to God, God amplifies your gifts, you use it to reach them, they know that that help couldn't just come from you. What does that do? That points them towards God. That's what it's about. It's not about glory for our church. It's not about glory for you. It's about glory for God. And if you're going to God, God's going to amplify those gifts so that they know it wasn't in your power. It was in God's power. That's exactly what this building is. That's what exactly the many people that are here today, that's exactly what that is. That's God doing this. Not me, not you. This is me giving God the gifts that I have. And God takes it and amplifies it in spite of my weaknesses, in spite of all my, my, um, my uh, you know, I, I struggle with confidence myself. I was talking about that a little bit this morning. And so it's interesting that I'm leading people that I believe struggle with confidence because if we listen to the lies of Satan we'll never step out into the water but that's what God has called us to do I'm so thankful for that what God is doing in our church God is doing in our midst and it's about pointing people back to him as a church I want to ask this morning what are we missing out on something that God wants to do what are we missing out on that God wants to do through us Paul says that God will do immeasurably more than what we can ask for or imagine according to his power that is at work in us and you notice he said the power because you gave it to God comes back down that's the power at work in us what is he wanting to do I believe he's waiting on you I think all he is waiting on is for us to bring what we have to him for him to use imagine this imagine if everyone in our church started to live this out imagine if everyone in this church started to bring their strengths their spiritual gifts and their weaknesses to God for him to use can you imagine how many people we would reach can you imagine how amplified the, uh, the, the, our gifts would be and how many people would fall into that net as we fish? When we bring all of our gifts and abilities together, we can do so much. Core value number five for us is unusual unity. And I think that's spelled wrong, Caleb. I didn't put it in this time. Uh, calling them out. Unsure unity. Unusual unity. And I'll be honest with you, God took me in a totally different direction with this unusual unity thing than what I was planning on. Um, but it's unusual when... Thank you. When it, it's unusual... When all these different people come together, different past experiences, different colors of skin, different gifts and different abilities, it's unusual when we don't have very much in common, but we still come together. 
That's what God has called us to do. Unusual unity where these people who have different gifts, different abilities, they look different, they come together to serve God. And God has not only called our church to that, but has called the global church to that. But it's a beautiful thing when it truly comes together. We're able to reach more people than we can with just a pastor preaching on Sunday when you're mobilized doing the work God has called you to do. And so church, just to give you a quick recap here, people are hungry and they're looking to us for help, and many of you struggle with that hunger as well. Where do you go for help? We're real bad about going to all these other things to help when God is the only one that can provide what we truly need. God wants to use us to meet people's needs. And so we have to bring what we have to God for him to use. And God will use your gifts for his glory. So the way I want to close today, I want you to, I want you to be doers of the word. I don't want you to listen to this and go away and not, not live any differently. Uh, one of the things we talked about in our Friday table gathering is that you should come to church every Sunday wanting to be changed. Having that desire to change. So the way I want you to respond is as simple as this. Make yourself available. Say, God, I'm here. Use me. You may only have five loaves and two, two fish, but bring them. So we're going to sing Build My Life here to end. And um, I'm going to invite you to respond by coming to the altar multiple ways you can respond here this morning number one you may need to repent for going to the world for help when you should have went to God in your personal life not only in your personal life but also when other people come to you for help where do you go do you go to worldly wisdom do you go to the things of this world when you're struggling with things or do you go to God to see what God says and see what God's leading you to do and asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you do you do that, or you automatically go over there? Or do you just do what you think is right, what you think is the best? We need to repent for that. Maybe you need to repent for not bringing what you have to God. Maybe you've been holding it back this whole time. Repent means to turn. It means that you're going to come up here and you say, God, I'm sorry for this, and I want you to work through me. Maybe you just need to simply come up here today and say, God, Please work through me. And then I heard this on Facebook this past week. When was the last time you just came to the altar to thank God for what he has given you? For the gifts, the strengths, the weaknesses that God has given you. When, have you thank, when was the last time you thanked him for just who he is and that he can use someone like you to reach people? Do that today. Respond however God leads you to respond. And then after the song, there's going to be some sign-up sheets located in the back of different teams that we need people to help serve on. We have 18 kids over there. My mom, it drives my mama crazy. <laughs> I hear a debrief every Sunday evening about 3 or 4 o'clock. We need more volunteers and kids. We need volunteers in the nursery. We need volunteers to clean the church. We need volunteers to help with mowing the lawn. We have many different teams that you can serve on. Get involved with what God is doing. We can do more together than we can separate. Stand to your feet. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, and Father, I thank you that you do still speak to us. Father, I thank you that you desire to work in and through your people. And, and for me, who I struggle with confidence myself, I question why would you want to work through me? Why would you want to work through someone like me? And do I even have anything that you can use? But Father, I don't place my confidence in my own ability. I, play, I place my confidence in your ability to work through me. And Father, I pray that same thing over the people in our church, the people who are gathered here this morning. Father, I pray that you would speak through them, that speak to them into other people's lives. And Father, I pray that you would convict us right now. 
that this word that you spoke through me this morning would be a mirror and we would examine ourselves to see do we personally go to these other things for help when we should go to you do we personally go to these other things for guidance and wisdom when we're hungry or do we go to you and then when people come to us do we go to you do we draw from your word where do we go father I pray that you would convict us of that this morning and that we would respond accordingly father I pray that we all would ask for you to work through us and father if you're leading these people today to respond by just simply thanking you for all that you've done for all that you are and for using them for being willing to use their gifts and, and their weaknesses and their, and their strengths. Father, I pray that you respond that way today as well. Father, I thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Altars open, respond accordingly however God leads.